Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I would like to begin by sharing with you a medieval allegory based on Oriental sources. An experienced hunter one day caught with his bare hand a little bird that could speak 70 languages. The terrified bird looked up at the hunter and said, release me and I will teach you the three secrets of life. And the hunter said, no, no, you, you teach me the three secrets and I will then release you. The bird having no choice then taught the hunter the following secrets, which I share with you. First, if you know that if you have made a decision that is unalterable, don't regret it. If you know that something can't be true, don't believe it. And finally, if you know that you can't reach your destination or attain your goal, don't dissipate your energies trying to get there. The hunter was content and the bird flew off. The bird may reappear, we'll see. The bird flew off. Now, this is uh, for me a particularly nostalgic occasion. It is whenever I visit a law school because it brings home to me how much the study of law and the practice of criminal law have changed over the past 50 years since I graduated. Beginning with entrance requirements, at this law school uh, you receive, in combination with other schools I know, some 2,300 applications. Only 180 are admitted. At McGill, we, they now receive 1,500 applications and 150 are admitted. In my time, all you needed was 50% plus one. <laughs> There were 75 applicants, 75 were admitted, but only 50 showed up for class on the first day. <laughs> I should tell you that the law school was at the time housed in a former mansion set back from Peel Street. And so I've harbored the image over these 50 years of the remaining 25 marching up and down Peel Street, not finding the law school and exhausted having then decided to choose some other profession, <laughs> like dentistry or counting, but they might have thought less demanding. It was also much harder at that time to skip classes. Attendance was both mandatory and required. I still have a vivid image of the great Frank Scott, our constitutional law professor, entering on the, the first day of class he had in one hand the class list, in the other his class notes. He put his foot up on the bench and called the roll as follows. Angus, Sir, Brown, present, Cohen, no answer. Cohen, dead silence. Scott looked up, a puzzled expression crossing his face, said, has this man no friends? <laughs> Recruitment on graduation was very different then as well. In my third and final year, I approached Joseph Cohn QC, who was our lecturer in criminal law uh, and the dean of criminal lawyers in Quebec at the time. As was his habit, he stood in the hall outside the classroom uh, between the one hour classes. There were two hour classes divided into one hour sessions puffing on his cigar. Um, I approached him and uh, he said, well, uh, Morris, what do you plan to do next year? Well, that was music to my ears because I thought that what a wonderful thing it would be for me to work for Mr. Cohn. And so, uh, but I said, well, uh, I was thinking of either constitutional law or criminal law. Uh, he said, well, criminal law is perhaps the noblest branch of our profession, but what do you plan to do for a living? 
In those days, uh, constitutional law was not a charter industry as it has become since 1982. It was concerned mainly with division of powers cases, uh, which were few and far between. Um, after practice, uh, sorry, after graduation, upon entering practice, there were differences as well. I appeared in Mr. Cohn's office with a wonderful beard. I must tell you, a truly wonderful beard. There are some examples here today. There were very few then. Mr. Cohn was a conservative man, and uh, he said nothing when I arrived, but as we left, he said, um, Morris, I have no objection to your beard, but please don't wear it during office hours. <laughs> I was so terribly upset, as you can imagine, that I haven't taken a haircut since. <laughs> um, there have, of course, been many technological changes as well, and I won't dwell on them. You all know that, well, you, perhaps you don't know. You assume that faxes and Blackberries and data banks and iPads and iPhones uh, existed at that time. We didn't even have fax, we had no fax machines, no internet, no data banks, but we managed. Another major change, and a very important one, uh, which is brought home to me as I look out uh, at you today, is the increased number of women who are now in law school, on the bench, and in practice. There were only three women in my class, only one the year before and only two the year later. And that for many reasons which we don't have time to dwell on today, apart from the fundamental fairness of the equation, is a matter that brings me great joy. I think it's wonderful to, have, uh, to be a witness to a change that we could not have anticipated when I was in law school. We had no charter of rights, no organized system of legal aid, and no Stinchcomb rule. I want to say a word about Stinchcomb, which in my view, shared by others who practiced uh, criminal law and sat on criminal cases, among them the late, great uh, G. Arthur Martin. Stinchcomb is probably the most important charter decision affecting the practice of criminal law in Canada. Um, not long ago, Richard Chadley, I think it's important to convey to you the changes that the Charter has brought. And I will do that only briefly because I did say I would address you on another topic to which I assure you, if time permits, I shall ultimately turn. Um, but not very long ago, Richard Chadley, who was one of the leading criminal uh, counsel in Montreal and uh, in the 60s, was um, a crown prosecutor. I hasten to add among the fairest and most conscientious so that you'll understand the import of what I'm about to relate. He was honored uh, some time ago by the Criminal Lawyers Association in Quebec and he produced a letter that I had written to him way back then in the 60s um, asking for copies of statements, copies of any information that the crown had in its possession which might be of use to the, defend, uh, to the defense counsel in defending his case. That's something you take for granted. Uh, Shadley was being nice when he produced this letter at the conference a little while ago. I was perhaps a little less nice when I responded by saying, I'm still waiting for a reply, 44 years later. So in those days, uh, defense counsel were not given the information which helps to level the playing field. We now have legal aid, we now have a charter of rights, uh, but there remains a need for vigilance to ensure in dealing with the right to counsel, in dealing, dealing with um, those who threaten our free and democratic way of life, that we preserve the very values that are the hallmark of our system of justice. You are the future, and I urge you with all my heart to remember the importance now 
in the years to come, when you go out to practice, for those of you who do, and simply as citizens of this country, to do what you can to ensure respect and preservation for the values, the <laughs> fundamental values that the Charter was created to protect. Of one thing I am certain, if you and others across the country, the younger generation of students, lawyers and judges, don't do it, we will not enjoy those rights for very long. Now, I'm well aware, of course, how long 50 years in the life of the criminal law must appear to all of you. But to place in historical perspective what has for me been a fleeting half century, I want to reach back much further still, more than two millennia, in fact, and to restore to its proper place in history a seminal development that has at times suffered a bad rap. I refer, of course, to the Lex Talionis, the biblical eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that appears three times in the Old Testament, in Exodus, in Leviticus, and in Deuteronomy. The Lex Talionis has been perceived mistakably but understandably as a barbar barbaric rule of retribution in kind. Read literally and from a modern perspective, that is entirely understandable, but nonetheless wrong. Understandable because even as divinely ordained punishment, an eye for an eye sounds both primitive and cruel. But the perception of the Lex Talionis as only that is wrong, because to read the Lex Talionis literally is to overlook its historical significance and enduring moral relevance. I have time today only to explain to you in a few words why the Lex Talionis of the Old Testament marked a watershed in the evolution of lawful punishment. In place of vengeance, reprisal, and random brutality, it introduced a policy of restraint, and it sanctified proportionality as a moral principle of punishment. This has long been recognized by secular and rabbinic authorities, by the church fathers, by modern scholars, and especially when it is properly understood as a principle of proportionality, not to be taken literally, but to signify the extent of compensation to which wrongdoers should be subject. I pause to mention that the Hebrew is ayin tachat ayin, eye under eye, rather than eye for eye, which like the Latin sub can be taken to mean in place of, sub signifying substitution. A less charitable view of the Lex Talionis has been at times expressed, but has never prevailed. Some early Christians, for example, rejected the Mosaic law as cruel and vengeful. They argued essentially that Jesus had replaced the Old Testament's law of retaliation with the merciful injunction to turning the other cheek pointing in particular, as you would know, to Matthew 5.25, where Jesus said, and I quote, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one in as well. In response, however, St. Augustine held that there was no opposition between the lex talionis, the eye for an eye principle, and the commandment to turn the other cheek. In Augustine's word, Augustine's words, and I quote, the old precept as well as the new is intended to check the vehemence of hatred and to curb the impetuosity of angry passion, to put a restraint upon revenge, unjust for its success, the law established the principle of compensation that the penalty should correspond 
to the injury inflicted. So the precept, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, instead of being a brand to kindle a fire that was quenched, was rather a covering to prevent the fire already kindled from spreading. And I, that's the end of the quotation from St. Augustine. Even the <coughs> patriarch, St. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, uh, who was not otherwise admiring of his Jewish contemporaries and wrote some pretty nasty epistles, uh, agreed with St. Augustine that the um, law of the lex talionis, the eye for an eye, was a civilizing principle because it encapsulated the notion of proportionality. Modern Christian biblical scholarship has also opposed the view of the lex talionis as barbaric and cruel. Now I turn now from proportionality as a moral principle of punishment under the Mosaic Code to its relevance in more modern times. Contemporary penal theory traces its roots to the opposing justifications for punishment advanced and developed by Immanuel Kant and Jeremy Bentham in the fertile philosophical soil of the 18th and 19th centuries. Kant developed a retributive model grounded in the proposition that the lex talionis provides the proper measure of punishment. Bentham's utilitarian model, on the other hand, left little room for the law or principle of retaliation. Pun punishment could only be justified, according to Bentham, if it had some beneficial social impact and not as a retributive tool, even as a balanced retributive tool. These opposing theories were debated by lawyers and penologists and academics for well over a hundred years. In the mid-19th century, H.L.A. Hart at Oxford uh, took it upon himself to reconcile, and he did to some extent, of the two opposing approaches to punishment. In any event, the debate that had endured the century following, century and more following Kant and Bentham culminated in Canada in the adoption of codified principles of sentencing, which are familiar to you and they're now enshrined in the criminal code. Uh, they were adopted in, they came into effect in 1996 when Parliament, following the recommendations of the Canadian Sentencing Commission, adopted a model which sets out a utilitarian goal, but makes paramount the retributivist principle of proportionality. The fundamental principle, not a principle, the fundamental principle of sentencing, of punishment, in Parliament's uh, view, as opposed to its utilitarian purposes, so the fundamental principle as opposed to the utilitarian purposes is that of proportionality. And you see that in section 718.1 of the criminal code, which reads, a sentence must be proportionate to the gravity of the offense and the degree of responsibility of the offender. In establishing proportionality as the fundamental principle of sentencing, Parliament thus reaffirmed not only the relevance, but the centrality to Canada's system of criminal justice of this seminal tenet rooted in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. It will be of interest to you to know that just some months ago in October, the contemporary significance of section 718.1, the proportionality principle, was specifically noted in a thoughtful legislative summary, a parliamentary document prepared by the Parliamentary Information and Research Service. And that document deals with the amendments brought about by C-10, uh, including mandatory minimum punishments, an addition of mandatory. So in that bill, uh, the Mandatory minimum punishment was increased in nine offenses. There are seven 
new mandatory minimum sentences for, for, for existing offenses and two new offenses with mandatory minimum <coughs> sentences. To understand the impact, uh, we'll have to wait to understand the impact, but 25 years ago there were a total of nine uh, mandatory minimum sentences. On the coming into effect of this bill there are now 50. Now, some things uh, that go without saying are best not left unsaid. And so I hasten to add in this regard the subject of mandatory minimum sentences and the principle of proportionality. That nothing I have said today in this regard or any other should be taken by you as an expression of my personal opinion. As a sitting judge, I should not be seen nor even thought to have expressed a decided view on any matters that may soon or eventually come before the court. In that regard, I want to share with you this story. Some years ago under the Soviet regime, a professor by the name of Pushkin was nominated for appointment to the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He received a phone call one day from a man by the name who introduced himself as Sergei of the KGB. And Sergei said, Professor Pushkin, we at the KGB understand that you have been nominated uh, for admission for appointment to the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Please be assured that we support the nomination. But I do have to ask you a few questions. Now the first question is, what is your opinion on the American role in South America, particularly Chile? Professor Pushkin said, well, it's interesting that you would ask that question. Just last week, there was an article in Pravda on that very subject. And I want to assure you that I believe and agree with every word. And Sergei said, well, uh, thank you, that, that's very good. Uh, what is your view of the Middle Eastern situation, the conflict in that area? And Professor Pushkin said, well, it's curious. Not two weeks ago, there was an article in Komolskaya Pravda on the very same subject. I read it carefully, and I agree with every word. And there was a third question which drew the same response. Finally, you know, Sergei said, Professor Pushkin, that's wonderful. You can be sure that we will support your nomination. But tell me, have you no ideas of your own? To which Professor Pushkin replied, no, I certainly do, but I disagree with every one of them. <laughs> Now, um, I know um, you wonder uh, what happened to the little bird when it flew up and flew away. Well, it perched on a near, high up in a nearby tree on a branch and looked down at the hunter and said, you really are a very stupid man. And the hunter said, why is that? He said, well, you had in your hand a little bird with a mouthful of precious pearls, and you let me go. Well, the hunter was furious, rushed to the tree, tried to climb up, made it halfway, fell down, and broke, alas, both legs. Bird looked down at the hunter and said, you are even more foolish than I thought. I have just taught you the three secrets of life. The first is that once you've made a decision, don't regret it if you can do nothing about it. You let me go, and here you are a few minutes later trying to reverse that decision. I told you that if someone tells you something that cannot be, don't believe it. Where would a little bird like me get a mouthful of precious pearls? And finally, I told you that if you can't attain 
your objective, reach your destination, don't waste your energy and put your life and health at risk by trying to get halfway and look at you. You knew you couldn't reach a little bird high up in a tree, and yet you set out, contrary to my advice and contrary to the secret, to do exactly that. The bird flew away. Now, uh, this was, as I said, a very intelligent, but not particularly empathetic bird. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't leave you. I'm here and I'll be happy to answer your questions. We can talk more about the right to counsel if you wish, in particular. Uh, I simply hope that uh, you won't forget well, the little bird's three secrets of life as quickly as the hunter did. That's yeah. my Sorry. eye for an eye. It, uh, Time for a few questions. Anybody has anything? Well, I'll start us off. No, that's okay. I'm happy to just keep talking without questions. It's yes? Yeah. You, you mentioned um, the difference between uh, a sort of utilitarian approach to criminal penalties as opposed to uh, the retributive approach. Uh, is there a way of reconciling those two things? Is there a utilitarian way to look at it? Well, I think that, that there is. Um, and uh, if, may I commend to you the Hart Lectures, or a series, I think, of 10 that dealt with that subject. So it would not, I would not do justice to combining them. Um, there is also, um, I'm down to uh, citing myself, but if you look at the <laughs> Oxford Journal of Legal Studies in 2007, there is a much expanded view of what I have said today about an eye for an eye. It was the subject of my HLA Hart lecture at Oxford, and I did there deal to some extent with it. And I, 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 I think it important uh, to, because you hear so much about an eye for an eye, and how people immediately assume uh, immediately see only the apparently barbaric side, but don't recognize the historical significance and modern relevance of the principle of proportionality. So that principle is expressed in different ways. It was one eye instead of two. It was, as um, Augustine demonstrated, it, was, uh, it had an element of compensation. Uh, the authorities, by the way, the uh, biblical, post-biblical, uh, medieval authorities uh, are somewhat divided, but most recognize that it was never intended that these punishments should be carried out literally. Uh, but rather, and again as St. Augustine, as St. Augustine mentioned, to reflect a measure of compensation, an appropriate and proportionate response. Now, I should tell you that it's not all that easy because that view brings with it, precipitates other questions uh, that are difficult to answer, as difficult as reconciling the two schools. For example, uh, if the eye for an eye is viewed as a compensatory principle, um, you place a value, and it's not to be taken literal, literally, you must place a value on the eye that was taken. Now, what is that value? Is it the value of the eye to the person from whom it was taken, who may have been a scribe, may have had only one eye? Is it the eye of the person who took it? And so there, there are wonderful discussions about the difference. But the, the, the important principle to retain <coughs> is the principle, the notion of proportionality. There's another aspect which uh, I uh, might mention to you. Under the Code of Hammurabi, which came a thousand years before the uh, Old Testament, uh, there is also talk of an eye for an eye. But Hammurabi's code provided for what has been called mirror punishments. And so, for example, if a builder were built a home, the home collapsed and killed one of the owner of the home's children, it was not the builder whose life was taken, 
but the life of the child of the builder. And that's what was meant by mere punishment. So the Old Testament in that respect, too, uh, was more civilized in the, in, an, in the sense that there was no question of punishing innocent people for the wrongdoing of their parents or relatives. In the absence of the proportionality principle, when punishment was random, when clans and groups sought to revenge, uh, all of this intended by the lex talionis uh, to be ended and done away with. In those previous days, when punishment was, ran uh, was random, innocent people uh, were punished and made to suffer. Do you think it's possible to approach restorative justice-type remedies in a proportional way? Well, what do you think? Um, I You've think obviously I, given some thought to this. Um, I'll admit I have class to talk about. But um, I think the, the principle of, or as I understand the principle of proportionality is um, sort of making one person suffer a loss that is comparable to another person loss or, or harm. So, and that's really kind of the opposite of what the idea of restorative justice is, is to sort of replace the loss as opposed to try to create a comparable version of it. Well, perhaps that's correct, but I didn't think of proportionality as being restricted to that, <coughs> that principle, um, but rather to some sense of what is neither excessive uh, nor insufficient bearing in mind, in a particular case, the um, circumstances of the offense and the character and background of the offender. Um, so perhaps it touches on the notion of restorative justice in, in the sense that uh, one takes into account the particular, the particular circumstances, background of the offender, both individually and culturally. Uh, but I think the principle of proportionality is broader and far-reaching than that alone. So just to shift gears a bit, what made you decide to be a judge of the Supreme Court? Well, um, the Prime Minister asking me. <laughs> But, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, I appreciate that question, and uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to, uh, to speak uh, very openly, very personally to you. And by the way, uh, you can ask me any question, uh, preferably a personal question, not so much about the law or about philosophy. Uh, that's a chance that perhaps you don't often get, and, and nor do I to respond. So I'm happy to tell you. Well, uh, you have to start at the Court of Appeal. And one day, I was very happy in practice. Uh, I practiced for 25 years to the day Wh and, and didn't aspire to a judicial appointment. Uh, one day, I received a call from uh, the Prime Minister's principal secretary. Uh, at the time, Mr. Mulroney was Prime Minister. And the secretary said, the Prime Minister wants to know whether you would agree to go to the Court of Appeal to replace, to succeed, uh, Fred Kaufman, who was then uh, turning 65, former partner of mine. He said, it's not an offer, uh, but um, it's, uh, he wants you on the short list. If you're interested, uh, do nothing. You'll hear from the Judicial Commissioner in due course. If you're not interested, let me know. And um, so that night, uh, I, that late that afternoon after the call, I called my wife and said, let's go out to dinner. We have something to discuss. I'm not sure that I should confess this publicly, especially if that's a video, but I shall. <laughs> uh, it was the second quarter of the second bottle of red wine <laughs> uh, that brought the epiphany, the chemin de Damas, as we say in French. And my wife turned to me at that point and said, you know, uh, you've enjoyed practice. You're not bad at it. <laughs> uh, but you love to write, and you love the law. As an advocate, you are advocating a position which is dictated 
by the nature of your retainer. But I think that in your heart you would like to write about the law from a more objective point of view. And you're not bad at that either. So if you're asked, uh, take it. Sometime later I was asked and I took it. I was very happy on the Court of Appeal for almost 14 years, didn't aspire to uh, go to Ottawa at all. And so, uh, but there were always these stories in the newspapers saying, um, about which as a former newspaperman myself, I can't complain, uh, saying that uh, the, there were the, going to be openings and uh, Prue, Fish, and uh, Baudouin were among the candidates. So um, I was quite ambivalent. I was happy with what I was doing. My wife had a wonderful job at the Department of Psychiatry at the Jewish General Hospital. My children, grandchildren, we're in Montreal. I have a farm nearby. Problem was, I said to my wife, if the Prime Minister calls, I don't think I have the backbone to say no. <laughs> and I consider myself fortunate, one shouldn't, about not having the backbone. Uh, but I didn't. The Prime Minister Krejcian called one day uh, and said, um, you know why I'm calling? I said, no. <laughs> disingenuously, you might think. And he said, well, I'd like you to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. I said yes, and I loved every moment. I should tell you, too, that uh, even at my age, and I, I'm con increasingly conscious of it, I don't feel my age, but I'm increasingly conscious, as I come to talk to students and say, well, you know, as recently as 50 years ago, when none of you were born, nor your parents, for that matter, um, that uh, Every once in a while, I hear a case and I'm troubled by it. You know, I wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, I still do at my age. I'd rather agonize before than after. And uh, my wife will sense that I'm awake and I'll say, you know, I haven't made much progress, have I? Here I am, 73 years old, and I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about a case. She says, well, just think how fortunate you are that you still care and that you're still passionate about the law and now go back to sleep. <laughs> so that's my Supreme Court experience uh, from the beginning to the present day. You know, I, I said to you, and I'm, uh, we, we do have, right. we have time, uh, and I had said to you uh, that uh, the, I, I urge upon you to uphold the right to counsel and uh, the right um, uh, the right to silence. And uh, I say to myself, well, those of you who have read Singh and Sinclair might say, well, Fish, you haven't done such a great job yourself, but I've tried. And um, when I was thinking about this the other day, and he said, well, I'm going to go back and read something that I wrote shortly after my appointment uh, to the Court of Appeal. And it appears in, it's a case called Dubois, D-U-B-O-I-S, uh, 1990, uh, CCC 3rd edition, around, I think it's page 166. And uh, will you be offended if I read some part of it? Because I don't think I can do as well now as I did then. Sometimes I, re I read something I wrote and I said, well, why did I do that? Uh, more often I say, I wish I could still, but this is the case. So here's what I said about the right to counsel. I think it's important to drive home to younger people uh, the need to recognize uh, the charter value and to understand what it was like when we didn't have a charter. Well, this was talking about the right to counsel and about pre-charter days. So I said, the right to counsel is a fundamental and indispensable characteristic of any free and democratic society. It is the sine qua non of due process and of a fair trial. But it is a hollow right indeed if those in acute need of its protection, persons under arrest or detention, are ignorant of their entitlement to the advice of a lawyer then and there. 
It is a hollow right as well if those in need, although informed of the right to counsel, are deprived of a reasonable opportunity to exercise it. And it is an unkept social promise if violation of the right to counsel is subject to no effective sanction and is condoned by the courts. Now, I wrote that against the background of practice where um, we didn't have a 10A and 10B. And, and this helps you to understand the informational component of Section 10 of the Charter. Most people don't know that they have a right to counsel then and there. And 10A is meant to ensure that they at least know and with subsequent case law are given a reasonable opportunity to exercise the right. Under 10B, uh, you have an opportunity to obtain uh, a, a remedy if your right is violated. Well, prior to the Charter, there was no remedy for violation of the right to counsel. The essential principles were the principles of the common law. If evidence was relevant, it was admissible unless excluded by some specific exclusionary rule of evidence, such as the rule against the admission of hearsay evidence as it then stood. And so you can understand, uh, I hope, uh, wait, let me add one other thing. In, in the 60s, late 60s, um, a study was prepared by the Montreal Bar for the Prevo Commission, a commission of inquiry on the administration of criminal justice in Quebec. 73.7% of defense counsel and half, nearly half, of the um, Crown Counsel who were questioned said that from their personal knowledge, from personal knowledge, persons detained or arrested were not given an opportunity to, conduct, uh, to contact counsel upon their arrest or detention. In the same survey, nearly two-thirds of defense counsel and just less than half of Crown counsel said that more often than not, which was defined as three or four times out of five, a detained person would not be permitted to call a lawyer until he or she gave a statement or made a confession to the police. I don't think we want to return to that system of justice. I can tell you too that uh, that at that time, because in the absence of charter protection in Quebec, uh, uh, sorry, before I do that, I'm going to come back to Quebec, but I want to mention that a study by the Canadian Civil Liberties Association at more or less the same time in the 60s and 70s uh, showed that uh, the situation in Ontario in terms of being allowed to contact counsel was no better. Uh, than in Quebec. Now, in the absence, so I return to the, what I was about to say, in the absence of uh, charter protection, it uh, had become a custom for a number of years to hold fire commissioner's hearings and coroner's inquests in middle of the night, beginning 10, 11 o'clock, with Crown prosecutors knowing that a person who is a suspect and likely to be charged was deprived of his or her right to contact counsel, knowing that, would question these witnesses well into the night and ensure that they were not given the right to counsel. I should tell you that uh, sometimes the persons questioned uh, were at least as clever and a lot wittier than some of the crowns by whom they were questioned. I have a transcript in a case in which I later became involved where Crown counsel says uh, to the witness, uh, Monsieur, uh, uh, this is a French, better in English, Monsieur La Rose, uh, do you know J. Leo Ramiard? <coughs> yes, I do. J. Le Leo Ramiard was said at the time to be a, uh, was a mayor of what was said to be a corrupt municipality on the south shore of Montreal. And Crown said, well, do you know what, uh, ce qui fait votre ami? what your friend Ramiard is doing now. LaRose said, well, Monsieur le Procureur, Monsieur l'Avocat, moi j'en sais rien, I don't know, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the can, I'm locked up. He says, well, je vais vous l'apprendre, I'll tell you. Monsieur Ramiard, élève des cochons. 
He raises swine, to which LaRose, looking the prosecutor straight in the eye, said, of the two-legged or four-legged variety. <laughs> uh, in the proceeding, they were, they were, he was charged, and a number of others, LaRose and uh, a fellow by the name of Aird were both charged. And this takes you to the absence of an organized system of legal aid. They were, they were facing very serious charges, but it's not uncommon uh, for an accused facing a serious charge not to have counsel. These two uh, particular birds had a sufficient familiarity with the law uh, to provide themselves with perhaps as good a defense as they might have had uh, by the volunteer legal counsel who were sent off by corporate law firms at the time uh, because people like myself who did many legal aid cases couldn't do them all. Well, in th at the preliminary hearing in that case, the uh, magistrate, the inquiring magistrate, turned to LaRose and Aird, who were both unrepresented, both in the dock, to explain that uh, although they did not have a lawyer, they were entitled to all the privileges that would otherwise be exercised on their behalf by counsel. So, so you know, after the witness being questioned by the Crown, you can cross-examine, you can make objections, you can call your own witnesses, and at the conclusion, you can argue. Well, the first witness was called by the Crown, and at the, after the witness had testified, one of the co-accused represented by counsel, through counsel, cross-examined. And then the judge turned to the same LaRose and said, uh, Mr. LaRose, uh, any questions for the witnesses? Avez-vous des questions pour le témoin? Oui, oui, Monsieur Jean, Jean A. Yes, yes, I, I do. And he just <coughs> kept talking to his fellow prisoner in the dock, his fellow heir. And there was dead silence in the court. The judge then said, Monsieur uh, LaRose, avez-vous des questions? Do you have any questions? Yes, 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 I do. Just a second, please. And finally, the uh, judge said, Maître LaRose, Counselor LaRose, if you have questions, posez-les. And the Rose looked up at him and said, Oui, Monsieur Serge, mais je suis en train de consulter mon savant confrère. I'm just in the process of consulting with my learned colleague. <laughs> so that was, uh, gives you some sense of the pre-charter world. It's not a total picture, but it's a glimpse. And again, as I said earlier, um, it's a place to which we do not want to return. And it's a place uh, that, uh, and, it, and you have a burden along with young people, you the future, uh, to ensure by zealous protection uh, of the Charter to ensure that we don't return there. Let me add this. There is one, uh, not downside isn't quite the apt word, but one concern that I have about charter litigation, and it's this, the fourth secret of life, which I hope you'll remember. Uh, there are well-established uh, principles of common law that over the years, prior to the charter, long before the charter, helped to provide for a fair administration of justice, as fair as the law permitted. It's not quite as good as now. More and more, young counsel, I find, overlook the principles of common law that would serve them better than a charter argument. And they go straight to the charter. And you'll find that reflected in the majority opinions uh, of um, my colleague Justice Sharon in Singh, and particularly in Singh, and later in Sinclair, but more particularly in Singh, where instead of challenging a statement given by an accused to a person in authority under the voluntariness rule, the Ibrahim rule, the common law rule, a younger counsel brought up with the charter often overlook the advantages of seeking a remedy or an, an exclusionary remedy, if you will, not under 24-2 with its balancing, but based on a well-established, firmly entrenched rule of the common law.
the back. Was there a reluctance? I'm sorry? Was there a reluctance after the charter was implemented um, to apply it either by uh, the Court of Appeal or Council in Quebec because of the I love your question. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, as you know, we had a Canadian Bill of Rights. You may know. We had a Canadian Bill of Rights, 1960, I think it was, or 61, um, which was a Diefenbaker Bill of Rights. And it was not constitutionally entrenched. It was said to be merely an interpretive document because it said no law of Canada shall be so interpreted or applied as to deprive of the right to counsel and so on. Precisely for the reasons uh, implicit in your question, the Bill of Rights never took off. And it's not, it's an oversimplification in my view to say that that is because it was not an entrenched document. We have the Quebec Charter of Rights, human codes, all of which have quasi-constitutional status. They're simple statutes. Uh, the basic laws in Israel have taken on a constitutional character, quasi-constitutional character. They're simply laws. And by the way, the Israeli Supreme Court, some of you may know, quotes Canadian jurisprudence very often, uh, as do some other countries. But they feel an affinity uh, with the charter protections which they have to deal with in much more, I dare say, difficult circumstances. So, um, I have always thought that the Bill of Rights did not um, develop, I don't know if one develops or grows teeth, or never fulfilled its promise, precisely because council didn't rely on it, invoke it imaginatively and frequently enough. And I don't think it's good enough to say, well, the judges in this case or that case uh, responded uh, meekly. The starting point, I mean, the judges are drawn from the bar. Um, if the Bill of Rights had been argued, uh, as I say, imaginatively and effectively, uh, it is my sense that it would have been had a much greater effect. And for those of you who are interested, you might have a look at a case called Itoshat, I-T-T-O-S-H-A-T, -T, which you will uh, find in, uh, all right, 10 CRNS. Um, and in 1970, CCC, uh, let me think, I'm not sure, but not really, I'm ashamed of myself. <laughs> the sign of age. Uh, but it's a reported case. In that case, um, I got involved, and I'll tell you how. Uh, the, ex uh, the executive of, in Quebec, the, the administration, had by, legisl by legislative fiat, or by, by administrative fiat, really, adopted a regulation that placed the judicial district of uh, Poste de la Baleine, Great Whale, in the judicial district of Autrive, in which it was physically situate, in the judicial district of Quebec, and in the judicial district of Montreal by legislative or administrative regulatory fiction. Now the purpose for that was that they had no courts in the north. And so if they arrested some poor soul in Great Whale, they would put that person on the next plane, indistinguishably, without distinction, whether it was going to Quebec or to Montreal. This person would arrive in Montreal, uh, be taken to the courthouse, uh, not really having the language, totally unfamiliar environment. Uh, the clerk of the court would uh, read the formula, of the option, how do you wish to be tried, and say, Vous avez le droit d'être jugé par un court composé d'un juge et jury, blah, 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 blah. And they had an interpreter. I'm convinced to this day that neither the interpreter nor the accused understood one another. Uh, there would be a five-minute discussion, and then the interpreter would say, "He pled coupable, Monsieur Jury. He pleads guilty." <laughs> and this poor devil would be sent off to Bordeaux jail for six months for a minor offense, 
uh, would not be returned home, would be given a bus fare, come to the end of the terminal on St. Antoine, and spend the ensuing years uh, as an alcoholic in Montreal. Uh, I still speak with a sense of outrage. Well, uh, I was asked to act in a case of that kind, and I did, and that was before Edo Shadow, the case of Tukolo, where uh, the, the arrangement then that I made with the Crown was he would plead guilty to some minor offence on the understanding that he'd be sentenced to time served, he was guilty of the assault, and that he'd be put on the next plane back to Great Whale, which he was. Sometime later came this case of Itoshat. Perfect, you know, luck plays a role. Perfect judge in arraignment court. Um, and the, um, when Itoshat appeared, same sort of thing brought down on a plane, uh, the, the judge, uh, Malouf, Albert Malouf, looked down at the legal aid lawyer and said, I see Mr. Fish sitting here. Uh, why don't we adjourn? He had a case like that. Maybe he could help you. And so I got involved in the case, and under the Bill of Rights, I argued for a stay of proceedings on the ground that it was unfair and oppressive to bring someone a thousand miles from his home, no access to counsel, no access to witnesses, witnesses couldn't, in a completely foreign culture, and that resulted in a stay of proceedings. One of the few under, at that time, and one, certainly one of the, there was a case of Shipley as well at that time, a little earlier, one of the very few. That resulted in what is, what subsequently became the traveling courts to the north. So sometime later, the government, fearing another case of that sort, created a system where a magistrate, a crown, and a legal aid lawyer would visit each of the northern communities in turn and to have a trial there. Now, when the charter came along, uh, there was a perception that uh, the charter too was at risk of the same sort of approach not because it wasn't a constitutionally entrenched document, unlike the Bill of Rights, of course, it was. But there was a fear of the timidity of counsel, that the timidity of counsel and perhaps the conservatism of judges uh, might deprive, might strip the Charter of its intended beneficial effects. Fortunately, as we all know, that did not happen. We have time for a few more. Um, so if there's, if there's a big criticism of charter law, it's that it's judge-made. Um, and for that reason, um, it legitimately comes into question that it's, that it's definitely complex for the average person to, to follow and understand. Um, with something like um, right to counsel, do you think that there's room for maybe a, a statutory framework that's a little bit more straightforward and explicit? Or do you think that um, the government may be afraid to try to legislate in that area, um, given that um, at least one piece of legislation I could think of relating to um, ability to search lawyers' offices that tried to be consistent with the Charter uh, got absolutely destroyed when it, when it made it to the courts. There's hesitation to try to create a um, Well, my quick answer is that the law is sufficiently developed now uh, in, in those areas. The, the Charter as interpreted by the courts. Uh, with, the, for example, under 10A and 10B, it's not sufficient to tell the person you have to provide them with an opportunity, give them a line if they can't afford counsel, uh, you have to advise them of duty counsel. So there is a pretty clear framework. Uh, the concern, and I don't know that legislation would do a better job. I'm a bit nervous about legislation that would uh, take away what uh, the courts have given by interpretation. If the inter now, Parliament always has the right, of course, uh, under the uh, notwithstanding clause, to declare that a, a provision of a statute, or of the common law, I guess, uh, certainly of a statute, it will continue to apply notwithstanding uh, the uh, judgment of the court. Wisely, Parliament has very rarely, and the legislature very rarely, exercised that power. But one must remember uh, the beauty of the Charter. 
is that it still reserves the ultimate word to the elected officials, provided that they're prepared to take uh, their political responsibilities seriously. And at the same time, unlike the Americans, we have a section one, not quite in terms of a right to counsel, but where the right to counsel uh, might be restricted by statute. It has been in times of emergency, the right to immediate access. Um, if the court finds that uh, that constitutes a violation of section 10A or 10B, or in the case of unreasonable searches, that's a little more complicated because you have unreasonable in section eight and again in <laughs> section one, and there's some doctrinal difficulties. But there is that safety value, a valve rather, that even where there is a violation, the government is given an opportunity to show that that violation um, is not inconsistent with the uh, basic principles of fundamental justice in a free and democratic society. Those two safety valves do not exist in American charter law. So um, that's the long answer. Uh, it's not, I can't make it into a short answer. Uh, but my instinct is that um, courts on the whole have been doing pretty well in shaping the law. Now, let me add one other consideration. You'll see that there are cases uh, that come out, the Ontario Court of Appeals case and the prostitution matter, and again, I express no view on the decision at trial. The majority or the minority decisions in the Court of Appeal, but not unlike decisions by our court, uh, the court suspends the execution of its judgment in order to give Parliament an opportunity uh, to fix the law. And that strikes me as entirely appropriate. It's one thing for the courts to uh, exercise their duty and fulfill their obligations as guardians of the Constitution. It's another for the courts to substitute for the legislative function their own views as to what the legislation uh, ought to entail. We're not in a, as good a position, apart from the political and constitutional considerations, we don't have standing committees, we don't have special committees. Parliament is in a much better, is much better able to assess uh, the advantages and disadvantages of various potential fixes, and then to make its choice accordingly. So that's the second longest answer to your short question. We have time for one more question. Yep. Um, you mentioned uh, many groups of people being ignorant of their rights within the Charter uh, of Rights and Freedoms. Is there any direct threat to the Charter by these people not knowing? Like, obviously, there's uh, personal harm from not knowing that you have the right to legal counsel. But is it possible for it to become a threat to the Charter itself? Very, very good question, and that highlights the difference between pre and post charter. Under the prior law, uh, there was no sanction, no remedy available. Under the charter, uh, section 24.2 provides that, for example, where evidence is obtained, uh, the, the wording isn't quite what I give you as a result of a charter violation. That's how it's, it, th there needn't be that direct connection, but consequent upon or accompanying a violation, uh, that evidence can be excluded. Well, that didn't exist before, so that's one remedy. Uh, the evidence can be excluded depending on whether its exclusion will bring the administration of justice, whether its inclusion will bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Under the old law, I remember coming home to the office one day very upset that the police had uh, detained a client of mine for four days before bringing him before a justice. And I complained to Mr. Cohn, and he said, oh, Morris, you're right, you're right, but you know the rules. The, his, the statement he gave will be admissible unless it's excluded under Abraham. No sanction for the arrest. His, your client will be executed on Tuesday, but his heirs will have a wonderful action in damages. 
So thankfully, we have better remedies today. So one more time, can everyone please join me in uh...